I've been muted for a little bit, so I'm sure I'm not going to repeat everything I said. Just want to say good morning, Riverside Community Church. Um, thank you that you're gathered to worship together. Um, you know, many have been saying uh, the church has been closed for like 11 weeks now, 12 weeks going into this week. Uh, but, the, but we have to realize the church door has never closed. The building has closed, but the body of Christ throughout history met in homes met in uh, people's rooms and we continue to engage continue to spread the gospel one way or another and uh, but we do look forward to the in-person gathering uh, where we can uh, just see each other there's nothing that can substitute for that in-person fellowship in-person connection so let's wait uh, and just pray for God's timing for our church for the local churches in this region and beyond but would you just join me in this time to pray to prepare our hearts to he, he, to meet God um, uh, we can't just can you hear yeah okay so uh, yeah just let's pray that we would prepare our hearts um, to hear God so let's do that at this time Please pay. 
Pentecost Sunday, as many of you may be aware, when the gift of the Spirit was poured out upon all believers. And I ask and challenge you, would you hunger for more of Him, not just once a year on Pentecost Sunday, but are we keeping in step with the Spirit as Scripture calls us to do? Have we been grieving or quenching the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity, God Himself and the Spirit? That you and I are temples of Him. Would you pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to sanctify our lives, continue to empower us to witness who Jesus is? also take a moment to mourn the lost lives, not just from coronavirus, but from the racial tension and turmoil that you and I are very aware of that is happening in our nation. The lives that have, we have lost and our black brothers and sisters that are going through not just the pandemic pain, but the century-year-old century of of pain and suffering, injustice and racism, systemic as just still prevalent, would you pray that we would mourn with them and empathize and sympathize, pray for healing over our nation. unbelieving friends or family members or relatives, neighbors that desperately need the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ that because he lives we will also live when we die to live with Christ eternally that's hope that this world needs Dear Father, thank you for bringing us here today. Um, dear Lord, we just look to your face again. And God, um, just as you have um, championed change and um, reform and you've saved us, oh God, I pray that we would um, look to your example, look to you, God, and be empowered and continue to bring change from within ourselves and continue to bring change to our communities and reflect Son and the values of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone needs compassion. Love has never failed. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. Of a savior, 
He can move a mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave.
and praise. Thank you, uh, worship team. <clears throat> Once again, uh, just welcome to our, our online community um, church service, uh, Riverside Community Church. My name is Joe. Uh, those of you who may have just dropped in through a friend or uh, just through God's providence, um, welcome you uh, as well. Um, just have a couple of announcements uh, at this time. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time or you've been but you don't attend or didn't used to attend Riverside Community Church and you have a prayer need or concern, please feel free to email me that and um, I will follow up with you and pray for you. Uh, thank you for those that have been um, filling out the Google attendance and prayer request uh, sheet every week. Uh, please do so again. And I noticed that a lot of you, a handful of you said uh, same as last week on t in terms of prayer requests. Uh, that's fine. We will continue to pray uh, for those needs and concerns. Um, so thank you for filling that out. Um, uh, Wednesday prayer meeting uh, through Zoom from 9 to 10 o'clock. Uh, that's been just going well. Thank you for those that are logging in. Uh, please continue to do so every week. Let's continue to pray and press through during this difficult time. Men's morning devotional, um, we have a handful of people every Wednesdays from 7.30. We go a little bit over 8, but you know, feel free to log in, log out. Some people, they're busy pre uh, preparing for their work in the morning. So, they, so they, you have, uh, some of you just have our voices and our conversations in the background. You have your audio, video off. That's fine too. Um, but I just want to encourage you, for those who haven't uh, logged in yet, I encourage you, let's run the race together and just spend that morning 30, 40 minutes together before the start of the day. So that's Wednesdays, every morning, 7.30 a.m. Um, 
And, and just lastly, just continue thanks uh, for those that are giving very sacrificially uh, during this difficult time uh, that we can support our missionaries throughout the world. Uh, Urban Mosaic Mission, they're just getting hit there in Mexico City. Um, physical distancing is not hard to, is, is very hard to practice in those rural areas and slums where you don't have the privilege of space. Um, so uh, our prayers are with them. Your giving continues to just support in these areas of ministry and missions, locally and globally. Um, and we do continue to pray that God would just uh, really provide and sustain you during this wilderness where God sustained his people uh, with manna, with just supernatural provision as well. And for those of you who may be in dire need or in any need for groceries, for anything, finance, please, again and again, I repeat every week, let me know. And our church will come around to support and provide as, as much as we are able to. So please, uh, we will keep that confidential. And uh, please let me know if there is a need. Uh, with that, let me pray and we'll enter into today's message. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. That because you live, Lord, that we too will live. That Jesus, you said, I am the life and the resurrection. And Father, we... Um, that because you also reign, God, we have hope. Even in this um, pandemic season of this long, bleak winter season, we continue to endure and hold down the post that you have given to us in our homes, in our workplaces, in our families, in our neighborhood. That we hold it down, we stay put, God, because you live. And we know that your spirit lives in us. And you have called us to stand in the gap in such a time as this to proclaim, to declare that your message of hope, of eternal life. And so, God, I pray for your people to, to be strengthened. Lord, I ask that on this Pentecost Sunday, as we re-examine our relationship with the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that you would create in us a greater hunger for this reality of your Spirit living in us, that we as individuals and collectively as a body of Christ, you have called us the temple of your spirit, God. And so we are. And we pray that your spirit would just guide us into all truth, point us into your truth that is able to set us free. And may your spirit work powerfully in and through this message time, in, in the hearing and, and eventually the doing of your word. Be glorified during this time of worship. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me, or you can look at the uh, s slides here, to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Listen now to God's word. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. There were about 120 of the believers there. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, they were the, uh, the Iranians in, in, living in Iran right now, uh, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Persia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, non-Jews who became converted to Judaism, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own language the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they're filled with new wine. In other words, they, they're drunk, and Peter has to explain that it's only 9 a.m. in the morning. 
we don't get drunk. So this is God's word. We're entering into our 12th week of online schooling for those of you who have kids. Again, this is just a way of me marking times and seasons. And I'm really hoping and praying that uh, we would be able to resume school um, and uh, organize sports uh, come September. I saw some pictures of other countries trying to prepare for uh, in-school, in-person schooling, and they had these like, you know, divided walls after each chair, and so you couldn't be near the next student that was sitting that used to sit close to you. And it was like, oh boy, I hope it's not that bad. But uh, just dreaming and hoping and praying that things would return to somewhat new normal. As for our condition of our nation and the state of our nation, I'm sure all of you have seen and read about the murder of George Floyd. Instead of going to um, you know, social media to write something, I expressed my initial anger um, through my weekly e-news that I hope some of you read. If you didn't, you can read again. What I wrote there hasn't changed, that there is a such thing as a righteous anger and um, an ungodly anger. And uh, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm, I'm at this place. It's, there's always kind of this mixed anger going on, and we're just hoping, God, give me a righteous anger that reflects your anger towards evil and sin. And, uh, you know, what, what I've been just doing this, this week was just to mainly uh, try to uh, sympathize and empathize with my African brothers and sisters and neighbors in this nation. Just reading and hearing about their stories, personal stories of injustice, personal stories of how they walk out in fear almost every day, stories of how their mothers often uh, tell them when they're just the little, little, little kids, you know, you're living in a, in a white, you're, you're just a black boy living in a white man's world, that that's a common story, narrative that kids hear growing up. And just trying to enter into their world more than just lashing out or writing um, just social commentaries and so on, but because I believe that, that before we move to action, that there's got to be a better understanding of their plight and their experience. To understand, again, not only the deep, deep nature of sin, the, the things that we've labeled as racism, and so on, is really uh, rooted in this sin. And all hatred, where Jesus said, even if you hate someone or are angry at someone, that that equals murder. So Jesus gets to the root of it, not just our behavioral expressions of what happens in our hearts, but I'm also trying to understand how sin evolves into a systemic evil that gets diabolically woven into every fabric of our society as well. How this gets played out when a white woman walking a dog in Central Park knew exactly what to say out loud to a black man watching birds. And calling the cops on Christian Cooper by saying there's an African-American man threatening my life. And on that same day, Monday, 12 hours later, George Floyd died. And I quote a newspaper reporter, George Floyd died in a way that highlighted the implications that calls such as the one Amy Cooper plays can have. George Floyd is who Christian Cooper might have been. Such as systemic evil, not merely analyzed but visualized before 40 plus million, dollar, million people that saw this video played out. My message today is entitled, What Does Pentecost Mean? What does Pentecost mean? I believe there's some relevance and timely message that I believe that it fell on this day and with all the context and news that is happening in our time. And from this understanding of what Pentecost means, I want to just draw out some implications, draw out some applications for the church today. 
As many of you know, today's our, uh, in our Christian calendar is the Pentecost um, uh, holiday. The Jews saw this. Uh, they counted 50 days, and uh, they, it was a harvest holiday for them. And at the, after Passover, they would count 50, and they would all make their religious pilgrimages to Jerusalem to celebrate the end of this harvest feast. And so all these Jews that were scattered, the the diaspora of the Jews that had mixed married, that have even converted to Judaism, like some of the Romans that we read about, gather in Jerusalem, millions of them, to celebrate this. And on this day, God chose to fulfill the prophecy in the book of Joel, that in the last days, which marks the beginning of Christmas when Jesus came to the second coming, these two book ends, that in these last days, God will pour out, my, pour out His Spirit on all people who believe, regardless of race or nation or language or ethnicity or socioeconomic status, regardless of all these things, that God would pour out equally and justly on all people who believe. And that's what we are seeing today, and that is really basically the meaning of Pentecost, celebrating the gift of God himself pouring out his spirit to everyone who believes and call on his name. Luke describes three things about this Pentecost event. First, he tells us that there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Think of hurricane sound just blowing through this 120 people that were gathered. Perhaps in that area was just like a hurricane. And in that whole region, they heard this mighty rushing, another verse says, translation says, a violent wind, shaking but no one was being hurt. In fact, the word spirit in Greek is pneuma, from which we get the word pneumonia. This, this, the word pneuma means spirit or breath or wind breath or wind, the breath of God that he breathed into Adam and Eve and they became a living being. Secondly, there seemed to be this divided tongues as a fire appeared to each of them resting on each of the 120 believers that were praying and gathered in the upper room. Imagine that. You know, I don't know. Tongue, shape of your tongue, but it's like a fire. It's lit. And it's on top of every believer resting on them, which was just an external sign that the Holy Spirit had made his inhabitation in in these people's lives. And thirdly, these 120 people that were gathered, they were praying, were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and we are told supernaturally that they were able to speak in tongues, a known language. It's like someone who never studied ESL, and all of a sudden they speak fluent English. That's what happened. So that all these people from different tongues and tribe and nation that were gathered there, all of them were able to hear at least one of these 120 disciples declare the mighty acts of God in their own language. They're like, whoa, aren't they Galileans? They have a particular accent, and I, I kind of lost uh, you know, the, the, la- he, the Hebrew language. I don't really get it, but how are they able to speak so fluently in my language? They were amazed, they were in awe. Some thought they were drunk. So that's what's taking place here. And in the following description, Luke focuses really mainly on the third phenomena of the Jewish Christians speaking in different languages. He focuses on that more than tongues. Why? Because Luke, a missionary partner with Paul that had traveled with him in first, second, third missionary journeys, is at pains to disclose the meaning and the purpose of Pentecost, and that was this. That was to, for God to gather people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, to fulfill the promise that he had made to Abraham through you and your families. I will bless all the families of the world. Again, this exciting redemptive storyline is being played out and fulfilled. Luke is at pains. This is why they're speaking in tongues. Tongues was a means to get the message out to declare the wonders of God and the beauty of Christ and his death and resurrection. And that's what Luke is at pains to highlight in this story. In verses 5 to 12, we read, 
Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews of the diaspora. They were gathered there, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in in, in his own native language? And we, and we read all the representative nations that were gathered there. And as they heard the mighty works of God being declared, they were amazed and perplexed. And they asked each other, what does this mean? This has never happened in our time. What does this mean? If I were to answer that question, what does this mean? What does Pentecost mean? If you read the following uh, passage, Peter gives this sermon where 3,000 people are saved. And and, uh, having studied that, this is what Peter would say in response to what does this mean? This means that God has been, God has chosen this particular Pentecost Sunday, this harvest festival to bring in a harvest of souls, to bring in people from every tongue, tribe, and nation because God has been longing to dwell in man and woman and anyone who believes that's what this means that this is the unfolding of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel where God would democratically and equally not that God would had his hand in the in the nation of of China and his nose was filling the nation of you know South Africa and so on but that fullness of his being was filling each and every individual that had gathered there why so that they can return home to their countries, to their own families, to their own nations, and invite them, invite each and one of them to believe in God, to look to Christ for salvation. That's what Pentecost meant. That's what Pentecost means even today. This was an earth-shattering, big, big deal, divine intervention from God. To us, you know, we're like familiar with the book of Acts, some of us, and we're like, okay, what's a, what's a big deal about that? Why do we celebrate Pentecost? Well, you see, if you understand the history of God's people in the Old Testament times, and bear with me, I'm going to get to how this is so relevant to our times. If you understand the, the devout Jewish mindset, how they regarded themselves, how they regarded other races and other nations, you have to read the book of Jonah. And I gave a sermon series on the book of Jonah. See, book of Jonah is a typical devout Jew who thought that in his chosenness, that God chose us, our race, our people, they, they forgot that they were chosen to be a blessing to all the families of God. And when you forget God's purpose for why he chose you out of grace, not because you were special or better, you begin to engage in presumptuous pride. You begin to become exclusive and tribal. You become, uh, you become a racist. You become evil in the sense that that you think everyone else is lesser than you. Read the book of Jonah. When God said, go to Nineveh and preach to them, that they would turn to me. But Jonah said, no, I don't want them to turn. I'd rather have them burn in your anger, in your wrath, God. And so he ran the other way. Jonah, devout believer. Pastor Tim Keller said this about Jonah, and I believe it applies to us. Jonah stands as a warning that human hearts never change quickly or easily, even when someone is being mentored directly by God. Man, he had to send a big fish to swallow him up. And even then, he didn't learn. It took him so long for his heart to change. Even when he saw revival and repentance break out, he was having a devotional of Sodom and Gomorrah and hoping that, where is the fire, God? He still hated them. And we don't know how the story ended. I hope he changed. Most people think he did because he leaves it blank and he wrote the letter to say, don't be like me. When you read the book of Acts, this whole book of Acts is really uh, the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Acts of the Apostles, the believers. When you read about it, we see the same racism being played out. Not only after Pentecost, but even after Holy Spirit falls in different moments and different events and different places. And one of the places where he fell again was this house of Cornelius, a Gentile. 
And Holy Spirit and Peter has these dreams, right? Remember? You know, all this dirty, unclean food falls from heaven, and God says, kill and eat. He's like, no, I don't want to eat these things. I, I've never touched unclean things. And God was saying, these are, don't call what I've made clean unclean. These are non-Jews. They represent non-Jews. And you are to declare. So through this dream, and he's persuaded. Remember? And he goes to Cornelius' house and preaches to them. And while he's preaching, the Holy Spirit falls on them. And they too speak in tongues. Again, not because the tongues was the important thing. But these Jewish leaders, they needed an evidence that the Holy Spirit wasn't showing favoritism or partiality, that they were receiving the same gift in the same way that they were receiving. And only then and there, the Jewish leader said, oh, well, I, I guess God doesn't show favoritism. I guess God has granted the good news of repentance to them also. You see, I've wondered if racism was one of the biggest barriers to evangelism and missions in the early church. I really did. I believe that same Some white Christian churches and also some Asian American churches like ours is like Jonah who struggle with different levels of racism in our hearts as well, if we're honest. We're not eager to learn and to enter into the plight of our African American brothers and sisters in Christ. An online letter was written by this African American black leader on May 30th, just yesterday. And he's writing this letter to the white Christian leaders and Ed Stetzer, who is, the, who is like the, the leader of Billy Graham Center at Wheaton, Illinois, that prestigious forefront Christian university in America. And Ed Stetzer shared this news in shame that, wow, this letter spoke to me and I hope it speaks to us. We're not comfortable getting challenged or rebuked, or, but this letter needs to be read. This online letter is called Letter from a Quarantine Home Expressing Disappointment with Some of My White Brothers and Sisters in Christ. This letter was trying to echo Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous letter that he wrote inside a Birmingham jail jail cell. So let me read just a part of this letter. He wrote, I cannot sit here complacent in Little Rock when my friends and family are restless in Brunswick and neither can you. Our interconnected web of humanness calls us to more. Your pulpit is not more important than your community. If you refuse to seek the peace of your city, you contribute more to the problem than you know. Seeking peace isn't just found in your inactive thoughts and prayers. It is found in your, it is found in your lock, lock arm step with the men and women fighting systemic injustice at its core. It is found in preaching about justice from your pulpits and not just on social media. Apart from doing at least those, those things, your works are empty and callous. Thoughts and prayers divorced from action hit the ceiling of apathy and negligence. I pray to God for justice every day. But I also pursue justice in my sphere of influence because it is required of me. And I call for you to do the same. I mean, I had to repent, you know, just writing about it, just putting a picture up of George Floyd in my social media and you know, saying black lives matter because they do is not enough. It's not enough. What Pentecost meant for the Christians back then and to us today is the same. And this is really what I'm trying to get at Pentecost reversed the curse of the Tower of Babel that you read in Genesis chapter 11. Pentecost reversed the curse of the Tower of Babel that divided people by gathering them together in Christ. Some of you may not be familiar with this story, so I just want to read it because I believe it's it's worth comparing Pentecost and the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11 verses 1 to 9 It says this, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words, so they were able to communicate, they were united. 
And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and, and bitumen for mortar. mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. They were being arrogant. They wanted to be higher than God. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of, of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. This is not just a mythology nicely trying to explain why we have so many different languages. It really did happen that they were trying to be united and, and just their arrogance reached to the heavens and it's kind of humorous that God had to come down. Okay, let's see how tall this thing is. What surprises me in, this, in that story is not the human arrogance because we have displayed this kind of arrogance time after time after time throughout human history. And God always crushes it because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. What surprises me about that story is verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they would do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. God basically says that when humans come together in unity, they're almost like us, almost omnipotent. Nothing that they propose to do will be impossible. Not that God was being threatened, I think. No, I know. But he said, this is not going to be good. Their arrogance would just create more destructiveness. And so let's come down and scatter their language and scatter them. The unity for evil will always, always be crushed by God and come to nothing. However, unity for good Unity for good, for God's shalom. Remember that word, shalom. The flourishing of all people where we seek the welfare of our cities, of our neighborhoods, where we seek, you know, just the flourishing of every person's, their education, their emotional well-being, their health well-being, their, their mental well-being, their societal well-being, their communal well-being would flourish that when we're united to advance that, I believe nothing is impossible. Yes, there will be progression until we get to heaven and it won't be perfect. But can you imagine the unity for good that God can use to bring healing to this nation, especially in the times like this? In light of all that we're seeing and hearing, about our divided nation during this pandemic that is only accentuating the hurt, the pain, the years of suffering of our African-American brothers and sisters. The meaning of Pentecost to me is so powerful and relevant and the role that churches can play to bring healing and solidarity and how there's a need for more not less healthy, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-generational churches to embody the kingdom of God and its values of sheer leadership of different race and color, that the church must be these pockets of resistance of the kingdom of God, display a countercultural place, that there's a need for more of this in our time. For example, Pastor Rick Warren's church, Saddleback, 
that represents over 175 plus nations and languages has been a force for good, much good in our society, in our time. He was the first white pastor to be invited to Martin Luther King Jr.'s church in Atlanta to speak on his, the 40th year of his assassination. That we are making bridges, we're seeing leaders doing that. I've recently heard of another black pastor, up and rising young pastor, dynamic pastor of a multi ethnic church, New York Times bestseller of relationship goals named Mike Todd, who shares how he's so humble because his prior pastor, senior pastor, was a white pastor. And he gave him the baton of leadership to him being a black, young black pastor. And he said he was humble by that. There are signs and pockets of kingdom values that are being displayed and demonstrated. We need more, not less of that. During my college years, I got to witness this one church, this Paola, Paoli uh, Presbyterian Church in this white suburb near inner city of Philadelphia. It was a very wealthy church, huge church. They gave 50% of their annual budget of tithes and offerings to local and global missions. And we were stationed there to be trained. And they had partnered with many uh, churches in the inner cities. Even though they were all white, they said we can't just let our circumstances and our location hinder us and prevent us from engaging in justice and compassion and mercy. So they actively partnered with some of these churches in the inner city, sharing their resources, their funds, people, Sending missionaries there, and I got to see that, and I said, this is what a church should be like. A few years ago, we sent our youth group to inner city missions in Lynn, Massachusetts, and I know some of your lives were changed. We need to do more, and there's things that we can do. Let me just close with this final thought and challenge. I think the challenge for us on this Pentecost Sunday is this. As believers, choose this day in what reality we will live. Choose this day. Will you choose to live still under the curse of the Tower of Babel? Where because there's segregation, because there's this, there's this ethnic, socioeconomic barriers and walls and there's all these cultural walls and custom and walls that we still remain scattered and just reach out to our own people, just associate with our own kind. That's what living under the curse of Tower of Babel looks like. We justify, we explain, we excuse. Or will we choose to live under the blessings of Pentecost? Where God says, because of me and through me and my spirit, you can come together in real unity where we celebrate diversity. Unity is not conformity and assimilation. It's acknowledging the gifts of diversity and diverse cultures and so forth. And celebrating that as a gift of God and respecting one another because bottom line, we're all made in the image of God. Will we live, choose to live under the blessings of the Pentecost? And I believe that is a challenge for us today. Will we be intentional about it? Will we be proactive to live under the promised land blessings or in the wilderness and Egypt blessings, curses? That is a challenge. Let me conclude with Dr. John Stott who articulates better the meaning of Pentecost when he writes, nothing could have demonstrated more clearly than this. The multiracial, multinational, multilingual nature of the kingdom of Christ. Ever since the early church fathers, commentators have seen the blessing of Pentecost as deliberate and dramatic reversal of the curse of Babel. More than ever before, the church must display a dramatic reversal, determined and purposeful reversal of the divisions that we see in our country, of the hatred that we see in the systemic evil. Christians have always infiltrated every sector of our society. 
We never say, you know what, let other people deal with politics, let other people deal with policies, let other people deal with these other spheres. Let's just kind of huddle in our spiritual closets, enclaves, and hope that the world will not sip in and influence us. No, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt. You're supposed to invade, pervade, and, and just infiltrate and rub shoulders with every sector in our society. It was Jesus that said, you're not of this world, but you're in the world. The implications are many. But my challenge is, let's begin where we're at. Search your hearts as I've searched mine. And I say, God, is there any hint of racism? If there's any hint of racism in my heart, in my life, point it out, highlight it. So I can repent from it. Because change won't come unless I be, I'm, I, I, I and you are first change. We cannot become change agents when we're not changed ourselves. So I think we begin there. Take small steps. And pray that God would use you and me to be a bridge to our brothers, especially our black brothers and sisters in Christ. Black lives matter. And for you to say, all lives matter, is to say to Jesus when he said, blessed are the poor, in Luke's version, blessed are the poor, period. Not blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the poor. And for you to say, no, Jesus, blessed are everyone. I love what Kimberly's daughter, Hannah, wrote on her, kind of Kimberly shared in social media. Hannah's understanding of Black Lives Matter is that when the body of Christ, when our body parts, when something is broken, when something is just has a paper cut, but my arm is broken, my broken arm matters more, matters first to the doctor. That needs to be attended to first, and that is just a brilliant insight of what that saying, Black Lives Matter. Even Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, when we look at the body of Christ, it says the weaker ones When one hurts, we all hurt. In fact, the weaker ones are the ones that we need to give more honor, more attention to, not less. Black life matters simply means that there are people in the universal body of Christ that are just hurting more, that are more broken. And God is saying, I'm a just God. Don't neglect that body part of mine. Attend to it. That's justice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray God, that you would soften our hearts. Blessed are those who mourn, you said. Teach us to mourn again. Teach us to weep when we see evil and sin. God, we confess that many times our hearts are so desensitized. Churches rise up in times like this and we, we, we demonstrate or engage in this peaceful demonstration and like Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther Jr. Only to forget about the whole thing again and just go back to our usual routine. But you said, blessed are those who continue to hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. God, we don't want to just get angry now and just forget, go back to our comfortable lives. But give us a sustained hunger and thirst after after your righteousness, which is your justice and your mercy to all your promise God that it will be filled when you fill our desires to see more righteousness and justice played out that we will never rest until we go to heaven where there will be just perfect justice and righteousness and joy in heaven until then help us to work 
Help us to labor in the cause that matters to you. Father, at this time, we, we pray for, again, the, continu- the families of Alma, Arbery, to the Christian Coopers out there that are fearful of just taking a walk, of George Floyd and his family, friends and relatives. Indeed, was a brother in Christ that witnessed to kids in the inner cities to baptize them in the basketball courts. to go back to his neighborhoods and witness Christ. God, we pray for just th- these families and relatives in this nation. Help us to mourn with godly sorrow that he brings healing, reconciliation, costly one. God, I also pray that before we look at the log in other people's eyes, that we would look at before we try to take out a little speck in our brothers and sisters' eyes, that we would look at the log in our own eyes. And Lord, this log has blinded us. And only you can take it out gently with mercy and grace. So we pray, would you do surgery in our eyes, in our spiritual eyes, in perspective, in our hearts. Humble us under your mighty hand. Give us grace to see, to act, to to love in truth. God, would you bring unity and healing to this nation? Help us to be part of the solution, not the problem. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're the only one that can give us the power to do so. So Fill your churches, fill us more yourself that we may yield to you and submit under your lordship we ask and pray in Jesus name Amen
of reconciliation for Jesus said you and I Paul said are ambassadors of Christ urging people to be reconciled to God and therefore reconciled to one another go in peace may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his countenance to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you his peace now and forevermore amen Have a victorious week.